Hello, everybody. We're going to talk today about math myths, math anxiety, and math learning challenges. I'm Kathleen Cotter Lawler, and this is the, what we're going to be talking about here is today is based on the work of Dr. Joan A. Cotter. All right, math anxiety. Most people are familiar with what that is, but basically it's a learned fear of numbers and sometimes anything to even to do with math. And it results in feelings of tension and fear at the sight of the numbers or sometimes even just the symbols. It causes poor performance in math and it creates difficulties while solving math problems and stress during testing. And the problem with this, the testing is that part of the working memory is involved with trying to overcome the anxious feelings rather than actually working at the problem at hand. And sadly, over 50% of the people in the US are affected. Now, this is interesting. Americans hide their inability to read. I mean, nobody runs around bragging, oh, I'm not good at reading. But yet we freely admit that we're not good in math. Interestingly enough, Europeans and Asians, if they're not good in math, they don't go around telling people. They hide that, just like they hide their inability to read. They believe that anybody can learn math with good instruction and hard work. So it can be learned. The fear of math is linked to lower achievements in math, which again, isn't surprising, but it's kind of, I, I find a little bit shocking when you actually think that just the fear is gonna give you lower achievement. And career choices are frequently based on avoiding math. There's nothing worse than a child who would be a fantastic scientist or engineer, but then doesn't because they're afraid of the math. More concerning is the Department of Labor According to the Department of Labor, math-related job growth will greatly outpace the overall job growth in the near future. So somebody with some anxiety issues or trying to eliminate math out of their career choices, it's going to become a smaller and smaller group that they're going to be able to do. So let's look at some of the math myths. So this is a myth that only certain people have a math gene. That's not true. Another, another myth is that this gene is often considered to be hereditary. Oh, he gets that from his father. Or, oh, you know, I, I'm not good in math, and so therefore my daughters aren't going to be good. That's not true. Our brains have specific areas designed for math. So everybody has this ability, unless you've got something else going on brain-related. Dyscalculia only affects arithmetic. So if you can have somebody who's bad in arithmetic or challenge in arithmetic, they can still be good in the, in the other 200 branches, like algebra and geometry and statistics, um, probability. Uh, there's, a, there's, just, there's a wide variety of different branches of mathematics. Another myth that we hear a lot is having a good memory is important for doing math. When actually, Albert Einstein said, which we all recognize as a rather smart math person, says never memorize something that you can look up. So you don't have to have a good memory. You just need to know where to find it. Joe Bowler, who is a um, professor, a college professor, says, I have never committed math facts to memory, although I can quickly produce a math fact as I have number sense and I've learned good ways to think about number combinations. So this is a math professor says she's never committed her math facts to memory. So we don't have to have a good memory to be good in math. Another myth, a mathematician solves problems quickly. They don't need to think. And that is very false because they look at math like a puzzle and it takes time to figure it out. Now, they tend to be good at it so that it looks like they're moving fast. It's just that they're thinking fast. Another myth, a person who is good in math rarely makes a mistake. Well, actually what happens is they quickly catch their mistakes. So they may make mistakes, but they can see, oh, that was a mistake and figure it out. They frequently take risks that may be faulty, but they persist until they get it right. Another myth is that boys are naturally better at math. That is not true. Girls often get better grades in math. Now, boys may have a slight advantage in, in spatial ability, which can be equalized when girls play sports. Girls sometimes may need to be encouraged to take risks and trust their intuition, but boys are not naturally better at math. 
Another myth in real life, very little math is ever needed. I mean, how many times have, have you heard that or maybe even said it yourself? But actually, businesses, financial, medical decisions involves advanced math. You want to make sure that someone's not just saying, oh, I'll just do this just this little bit, but rather have the statistics behind it so that when you're investing your money or you're making business decisions or medical decisions, that it's, it's got solid math behind it and we're doing the right things. Math is needed to understand our natural world from the atoms to the stars. Math is essential for new, new knowledge and future discoveries. Another myth is that learning math is drudgery and should be gotten out of the way as soon as possible. Actually, mathematics is a gift from our creator. Math is meant to be enjoyed. So it's not drudgery. We should enjoy it and find the fun in it. So let's look at some learning challenges because these are real. Approximately one in 10 children have learning challenges and traditional methods of teaching are a source of frustration and failure for these children. Um, Michael J. Fox says, if a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And rote memorization for these children is almost impossible. Since you guys all know how to add one, two, three, four, we know how to add, we're going to use letters in place of it just to kind of give you a feel for what memorization looks like. So we're going to say A is one, B is two, C is three. Okay, everybody comfortable? What's G plus H? Now, some of you have checked out already because you don't know the answer. Well, let me help you out here. Let's get a number line. So we're getting a number line here. We're starting with, uh, I'm not quite sure what that is down there. If you can see my arrow, I don't know what that is, but here's the first one, A, because actually this, is, this would be zero. It makes no sense to kids, the young ones. So they understand what one is, but they don't understand what zero is. So we're gonna start, A is one, B is, B is two, C is three, okay? So I can use my number line, I've got G plus H. I have to use my one-to-one -one correspondence here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So I happen to have done correct one-to-one -one correspondence. And then we can see that the answer is O. So G plus H is O. Everybody comfortable? Okay, now I want you to start memorizing these things. What's G plus C, E plus G, H plus I? Look at this. This is what it looks like to your kids if they just have to memorize things. This is crazy. And then just in case you get that under control, then you have to do subtraction by taking away. What's E minus C? Oh my word, I have no idea. This is what it looks like to the children. So like I said, especially those, I mean, never mind if you don't have any challenges, but if you've got challenges, this is almost impossible. And then when memorization does occur, it doesn't stick around very long. So what happens sometimes you got a child with learning challenges, their parents, teachers are often tempted to delay teaching math and concentrate on reading. But actually research shows that young children who are competent in math, and I'm not talking about counting, but they're competent in math will actually be more competent in reading in elementary grades. So math is actually providing a foundation for this reading. So math should be leading, not the reading. Children learn better when they're active. They need to physically manipulate objects to touch them and not watch somebody else do it. Let them do it. Let them explore it. You know what it's like to take your child grocery shopping, especially those young ones. They have like octopus arms and they can reach both sides of the aisle. They wanna to touch things. Same thing with their math, let them touch it. They need to explore and learn. But then whatever they're exploring and learning with needs to be something that's visualizable, meaning it can get in their, their mind so that they can see it. So visual is seeing with our eyes, visualizable is seeing with our mind's eye. So I can close my eyes and I can see something. That's something that's visualizable. Research shows that we learn best with visualizable images. So this is what we want to use. For quantities to be visualizable, they must be grouped in fives and tens, just like our hands. This is actually called subitizing. Subitizing has been around for 
well, actually it's been around forever, but the researchers have been talking about it for about maybe the last 20 years. It's been kind of a mainstream thing, like in the last, oh, probably three to five years. It's the instant recognition of a quantity. So if I put this up, how many's there? It's two. Nobody had to count it. You can see it. That's subitizing. This would be three, five, seven, and 10. That's subitizing. Now, it can be extended when the quantities are grouped in fives and tens, just like our hands here. We can extend it to fives and tens. So let me just show you real quick, grouping in fives. If I ask you here, how many's here? Okay, some of you are trying to count it, some of you are trying to group it, some of you are going, I don't care what the answer is. Well, let me do this, let me group it in fives. So all I did was just move them over, grouped them in fives, now how many are there? And most of you can look at that and go, oh, well that's five and four, that'd be nine. See how the importance of grouping in fives, without it, chaos, with it, easy peasy. Now, some people might have a difficult time seeing this five, but five has a middle, whereas four does not. So that makes it again, very easy to subitize, to recognize a five. Now we're going to extend this to a manipulative that is visualizable. So we're gonna look at visualizable quantities. So I'm gonna have the child show me three, three, I can see it. I don't have to think about it. Show me five and five. Here's seven. So I have five and two more. So I can recognize that this is seven. So this is going to be my blue hand. This is going to be my blue beads. This is going to be my yellow hand or my yellow beads. And I can quickly do seven. And 10, all the fingers, all the beads. Oh my goodness, children just love 10. Now this right here, this is my symbol 10. This is my quantity 10, quantity 10, quantity 10, and symbol 10. Some kids think that this is 10. It's not, it's the symbol that represents this quantity. And for those of you that, that get this, you know, I mean, you, you know that 10 means, you know that this symbol means this quantity, you've got this. But there are kids that do not realize that this symbol means this quantity. And so they try to memorize symbol plus symbol equals the other symbol, and it just gets really, really weird. Now, what would this be? Well, hopefully you're saying 40, but we could also call it 410. Right, because I've got 10 four times, 410. This would be, let me back up here. We actually call this the math way of saying the numbers or transparent number naming. So this could be 410. This would be, now some of you didn't quite see here, I've got a color change again. So I've grouped it five and two more tens. So I have a total of 710, also known as 70. So like we said, in, for something to be visualizable, the quantities must be grouped in fives. That brings it back to the child being able to visualize it, to be able to make it visualizable. When, child, when a child has learning challenges, we wanna reduce the memory load. They can't memorize things. So we don't want them to recite the numbers 10 to 100. We want them to use the transparent number names, number, number names like we talked about here. It's like 710. So this is what the transparent number names look like. So 10 is gonna be 10, 11 would be 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, 10, 4, 10, 5, 10, 6, 10, 7, 10, 8, 10, 9, 2, 10. We're gonna continue from there. We only go up to 9, 10, 9 because our English language only has from 11 to 99 goofed up. All the rest makes sense. Yes, this is not something that your kids are gonna do this forever. They're not gonna go off to college going, hey, mom, I need 610 bucks. They're gonna come back to calling it 60. This is just a temporary way of saying the numbers to help the children understand the number sense. So little ones might do this for a couple months, older ones might do it for a week or even just a couple days. 
Why is it important? Here's another way of looking at it. When you teach a child to read, do you teach them the alphabet, A, B, C, D? Or do you teach them the sounds of the letters, abacada? Well, most people are teaching the sounds. So if I have cat, 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 oh, cat, because you can hear the sounds of it. It helps you make sense of the word. Same thing with the numbers. We teach them the kind of the sounds of the numbers. So 310 would be 30. 310, I'd have 310 in there. There's only 11 words needed to count to 100 using the transparent number way of saying, saying the numbers. Whereas there's only, tw there's 28 in English. So it's much easier, much less to remember. Asian children learn this way of saying the numbers. They understand place value in first grade, whereas only half the U.S. students understand place value at the end of fourth grade. So this helps them with the place value. It helps them with their memory issues. They can remember the numbers. So let's look at this. Let's look at place value on the abacus. If I put this many beads on, how many do I have? Say it the math way. You have 210. There's 210. Here's my place value cards, two, 10. So how many tens are in two, 10? How many tens are in two, 10? It's kind of like saying, what's your name, Bob? It's right there. There's two, 10 in there. Now, again, if I know it as 20, how many tens are in the word 20, or not in the word, but in the quantity 20? I don't know, you can't hear it. But how many tens are in two, 10? There'd be two of them. This would be 310. Here's my place value cards again, 310. This number we're gonna call 3107. Here's how we write it. I've got my 310 card here, and I've got the seven card. I'm gonna put the seven on top of here. I'm gonna line to the right side. I have 3107. So if I get confused and wonder, what's that three doing next to the seven? I can take the seven off and go, oh, that's right. That was three, 10, seven. Three, 10, seven. This is going to be six, 10. This is six, 10, two. And here's how I write it. Also known as 62, but for a short spell, I'm going to call it six, 10, two. This is going to be 10, 10, 10, 10. Also known as, again, watch my place value cards, 100. So we want to reduce the memory load. We're not just going to recite the numbers from 10 to 100, but rather we're going to use transparent number names. So 23 becomes 2103 and 74 becomes 7104. This gives the order and clarity to the numbers. And it makes place value a natural part of the numbers. How many tens are in seven, 10, four? Seven, 10, four. You can hear it, it's right there. Learning algorithms. Math is so much more than just a, a bunch of algorithms and formulas. Rather, it's the use of it has changed greatly over the centuries. We used to use um, math to add long, long columns of numbers and multiply large numbers together, but we don't really do that anymore. We, we use the calculators and, and computers for that. So yes, the children need to know how to do it, but they don't have to be super duper proficient because again, most people use a calculator or computer for it. But what they do need to learn is estimating skills and simple mental calculations. That's going to be far more important. So when we're doing this, we want to teach, when we're teaching, or excuse me, when we're learning algorithms, we want to teach concepts before the procedures. Because it sh research shows that what is understood will be retained longer and is more likely to be applied to other situations. So we want to have the concept and then the procedure. A fact is considered to be known if it can be recalled in two to three seconds. This gives the students, the children, time to, to figure out how to do something. It gives them time to visualize and then produce the fact. So let's look at some of these using an abacus. So with adding, I've got four plus three, four plus three more 
equals, oh, I've seen that number before, that's seven. And the children can actually, it's, it's a lot faster to do this than doing four plus three is um, four, five, six, seven. It was a question. You can see it this way. Four plus three is seven. So like I said, it gives the children time to visualize and then produce the fact. And visual strategies help the children learn their facts. So what is a strategy? A strategy is a way to learn a new fact or to recall a forgotten fact. And a visual representation is a very powerful strategy, being able to see it in your mind. So this first strategy is called complete the 10. So I've got nine plus five. I'm gonna put nine on the first row, five on the next. I'm gonna complete the 10. So I'm gonna trade this speed for this speed. And when I trade them, I'm gonna do it at the exact same time. So I'm gonna do one, two, three, trade. Answer is? 10, four, or 14. See how that math way again of saying the numbers really helps with the facts here? Let's do another one, nine plus seven. I've got nine in the first row, seven on the next. Complete the 10, one, two, three, trade. Answer is 10, six, or 16. This next strategy is my personal favorite. This is the two, five strategy. Eight plus six. I've got eight on the first row, six on the next. Before I do anything, can you see the answer? Look at the blue beads. How many are there? There's 10. How many yellow beads? Four. There's our answer. 10, four, or 14. Isn't that just super cool? You can see it. Let's do another one here. Let's do seven plus five. And those of you that are quick with patterns, you can immediately see I've got 10 and two more. Seven and five is the same thing as 10 and two. Let's look at multiplication on the abacus. So here I have six taken two times. So it's six times two. I can see my answer is 10 and two more, 12. Let's do six taken three times. I have five, 10, 15, three more makes 18. Six times four. Okay, now we're getting into a lot here. So let's group them. I've got 10, two 10, so 24. Now I have five times seven. I can group them in tens. I've got oh, five times seven. I've got 10, two 10, three 10, three 10, five, or 35. I could also do it because after a while I've learned that this is 25. So 25 and 10 more is 35. So I have different ways, different strategies to figure this out. Here's seven times seven. This is actually one of Dr. Cotter's favorites. So you've got 25, 10 more makes 35, 45, and 49. So what happens again is the child uses this enough, this frequently enough, that they can actually see that. So when some, someone says seven times seven, they can see seven, seven times. Oh, that's right, 25, 35, 45, 49. I can do that in two to three seconds, and I have my answer. I like this one, nine times three. We can do it one way where I can complete the tens, and I can quickly see that my answer is going to be two, ten, seven. Or I like this way. I look at it and say, how many beads are on these three rows all together? So three rows all together would be 30 or 310. So 30 minus, I didn't use three of them here. So 30 minus three is 27. I like this way. Let's do another one this way. So I've got nine times seven. So how many rows are on these rows all, excuse me, how many beads are on these rows all together? There would be 70 minus seven is 63. Isn't that neat? I just think that's so cool to see how it's, how it's laid out there. So visual strategies will help the children learn their facts. Use games, not worksheets, but use games to help the children practice. Why games? Well, games are to math like books are to reading. When you first learn how to read, you read books, preferably interesting books. Same thing with math. As I'm learning it, I'm going to play games, preferably interesting games, and we're going to learn it. The games provide the repetition that's needed for the automatic responses, and more importantly, the games provide an application for the new information that the children are learning. 
So I'm gonna show you a couple quick games. This first one's called Go to the Dump Game. It's a go fish sort of game where the pairs, instead of being like a two and a two and a three and a three, are things that equal 10. So one and nine, two and eight, three and seven. And of course, I'm gonna use my abacus to build my strategies, and build my visual representations. So if I have a seven in my hand, seven needs what to make 10? Three. So mama, do you have a three? No, go fish. It's a simple game. The kids will play it for hours to the point that you will cheat to lose to get out of there, which is bad parenting, but it happens. Here's another game. This is called Ring Around the Products. This is a game to review the multiplication facts, and the goal is to collect the most cards. So I'm gonna start out with my multiplication card. So I have six of them laid out here, and I'm gonna ring them, which is why it's called Ring Around the Products. I'm gonna ring them with the numbers one through 10. So as I look at this, 54, what two cards make, when they multiply together, make 54? Six and nine make 54. So I can scoop these up. So I got some points now. 12 needs what? A three and a four. I have a three, but no four. What else could I do with a 12? How about a six and a two? Yay, got more. 42. Seven and a six, I don't have a six. 50 needs a five and a 10. I've got the five, but no 10. 15. Three and five, yay, go me. And nine needs a one and a three and a three. I could also do a one and a nine. I don't have either one of them. So now my turn's over. Now it's your turn. So you're going to fill in. And now it's your turn. What is it? It's a worksheet. Again, the kids will play it for hours to the point that you will cheat to lose to get out of there, which is bad parenting. But hey, it happens. But the kids love it. They can play these games and they're practicing their math facts. So we wanna use games, not worksheets for practice. Now let's take some of these ideas and move them into problem solving because this is often a very troublesome area for children, but yet that's the point of mathematics is to solve problems. So we need to work with it. We need to approach it like a puzzle and struggling is a natural and necessary part of the struggle which means we also have to teach our children to develop persistence. Uh, imagine the story problem with simple numbers and sometimes drawing a sketch will help it. Avoid teaching key words such as all together or how many because or how many left because real life problems don't have that. So don't teach that because there's Curriculum writers like us who will say there's 40 tiles in a box and we bought 15 boxes. How many tiles do we have all together? Which most of the time people think, ooh, we add it. Is this really an addition problem? It's not, it's a multiplication problem. Again, life doesn't come with key words. So don't teach them. Rather, use part whole circle sets. So this is a part whole circle. So here's my whole, here's my parts. So if I've got a whole of seven, a part of four, what's my missing part? That'd be a three. So let's put this in a word problem. Lee received three goldfish as a gift. Now Lee has five. How many did Lee start with? How often do the kids say, oh, answer's eight? Because they look at it and they just think they're supposed to add. Well, let's, let's listen to the problem and see what it is. Let's work through it. So is three a part or a whole? Well, Lee received three goldfish as a gift. Well, that would be a part. So I'm gonna put it down here. Is five a part or a whole? It says now Lee has five, that'd be a whole. So I'm gonna put it up here. So what's my missing part? Now, when I do this, is this, is this the, putting the two in there, is this addition or subtraction problem? Actually, it's either, it's both. You can have it be either which way. So when you're writing the equation, I can do two plus three equals five or five minus three equals two. You can do it multiple different ways. Writing the equation does not help the children solve the problem. It just simply records what they've learned. The part whole circles help the children solve the problems. Here's another problem solving situation. I've got, air, we know area is the number of square units that fit inside something. So here I've got a shape, 
Here I've got these square units, and I want to know how many square units will fit inside this box. Well, I can see I've got one, two, three, four. Oh, okay, I can actually put in four times three or 12 of them. So area is 12. Now, how did we figure that out? We could have just said it's width times height or four times three, which gives me the same thing, 12 square units, which I can also write as 12 square units. Now, what if I have a triangle? Okay, it's half of what I had with my rectangle. So what is my area? What's the formula going to be for the area of my triangle? Wouldn't it be half of my rectangle? So one half width times height. Now, sometimes with the area of a triangle, people like to say one half base times height. We like to say one half width times height because that links it closer to what you say when you've got a rectangle, or excuse me, a rectangle. You say width times height. So we're gonna say one half width times height. There's been situations where kids have seen that they are, know that the area of a triangle is one half base times height, and they don't really see what the base is. They don't see how it's related to the rectangle. So use width, width times height. So looking at this here, now here's my original, and I've got be one half times four, my width times three, my height and I have six square units. Now, for those of you that aren't quite certain, let's go look at this. Let's do a little problem solving with this. Let's count these out. I got one, two, three, four. These two are match, they match, so there's four. These guys match, five, and these match, six. So we can see why there's six square units in here. As a summary, traditionally, we insist that children memorize the counting words to 100 before doing any kind of math. But about 20% of our kids have difficulties with these and then they fall behind and they usually don't catch up. But our solution is to teach the names of the quantities to 10, so one through 10, and then use transparent number naming from 11 to 99 and then connect that math way of saying the numbers with the numbers that we use traditionally. Traditionally, we ignore the children's ability to visualize, but if we use visualizable manipulatives that group quantities in fives and well, as well as tens, they can visualize it, like the abacus. Traditionally, we use flashcards and time tests. Okay, most of you are getting a little faint even thinking about that. It's like, ew, I don't wanna do that. Well, why would you do that to your kid? So instead, we're gonna use strategies for learning the facts and we're gonna play games so that the children can enjoy the practice. Traditionally, we teach math like it's a bunch of rules without any rhyme or reason. This makes, diff this makes advanced math very difficult and it makes applying it a total mystery. So the solution is, is to teach them for understanding. Ask questions that require the child to think, not just parrot back the answer. Have them think it through. In conclusion, math needs to be taught so 95% is understood and only 5% memorized. Dr. Cotter says our goal as a teacher of mathematics is to help our children transform, expand, and refine these beginning ideas into deeper mathematical thinking. Well, I hope this gave you some ideas on math myths, math anxiety, and math learning challenges. If you're looking for more information on this, please come to our website, write start math, R I G H T, startmath.com. Take care, have a wonderful day. Bye bye.